welcome to the next uh, episode of Annex Cloud Market Movers, where we bring in amazing market luminaries and experts. Today, I'm excited to welcome TJ. TJ is the co-founder and CTO of Pixel Media, uh, a long-term time Annex partner, as well as amazing expert uh, on the Salesforce ecosystem. TJ, welcome to Annex Cloud Market Movers. Good morning, Al. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Great, TJ. It's been a quite a uh, a, a challenging time, uh, both uh, economically as well as internally within the U.S. Recently, um, you know, I, we're going to keep it uh, specific to, to to business and and how we can help our you know common customers sort of realize and and understand the times and and sort of plan for the future. You know, the first thing I want to sort of focus on in your focus of um, you know. Uh, commerce and digital transformation and you guys have done a terrific job over the years in helping companies digitally transform and and bring commerce to the forefront uh and some amazing successes in the salesforce ecosystem especially you know could you talk a little bit about what's changed recently and, and how digital commerce is sort of exploding and then how do how do keep people keep up with these times uh, that are coming up yeah, it's been interesting. Um, you know, the situation that we're in has shut down traditional retail as we know it and um, put a focus on digital. So I think what we're seeing with a lot of brands is a renewed focus on the seriousness of digital as a channel that is um, sort of all encompassing. So it's it's been interesting. Um, we are fortunate to have a lot of brands that take digital very seriously. And when I say very seriously, I don't mean they never, the other clients don't. I mean that it's a central part of their strategy. So, you know, we're starting to see while there are two and 300% increases in e-commerce, we're still seeing 70, 80% revenue drops, right? So even when you get excited that e-com's going crazy, the reality is they're still down 70%. So, and as we're slowly starting to see the nation reopen and retail start to reopen, we're starting to see retail become the urban warehouse and the urban fulfillment center for digital. Um, whereas before digital was sort of the excess um, fulfillment center of retail. Um, in, in sort of the traditional sense. So there's a lot of dialogue and there's a lot of dialogue about what brands could be doing quickly and simply to lean into what's going on right now and try and get a leg up because everyone's cash starved, time starved. Um, but there are some things that you can get going buy online, pick up at store, buy online, pick up curbside. Um, you know, there's a lot going on. And I think there's a renewed interest in digital as the primary conduit for transactions and retail is being sort of relooked at, especially in light of the events of the last couple of months. Yeah, very interesting. And, you know, one of the statistics I was looking at is, you know, commerce as a part of retail, um, you know, about a decade ago was about 5.6%, moved from there to about 14%, took it a decade. Uh, and, and just in this time, it's gone from 14 to 27%. So we've done almost a, about a decade's worth of growth in less than two months uh, in this sense. But at the same time, you know, there are two sort of specific things I want to get your insights on. One is if I'm an exec at a retail company that you know, is hard hit by the times. It, it's, you know, they're, they're, we're, I'm trying to get my business going, as you said, I'm 70% down. So my, my, my thought focus is probably a little bit more operational uh, rather than as long-term I'm, I'm trying to survive. And on the other month side, by month, you, month by right. month, exactly. And then on the other side, there are some that are actually seeing a surge if they were digital first, or if they were in a vertical, like grocery, for example, where they are not seeing the impact as heavily they have a different problem, right? They have different operational challenges and how they're looking at it. So if I'm an exec in, in those sides, and we can take two examples, how would I how would I prioritize business, people, and just survival versus figuring out what to do to improve and, and, and adapt? Yeah, you know, Al, that's a that's a really complicated question to give a one size fits all, right? So I mean I work with about 40, 45 brands right now. And they're all over the place. We've got a client that did 60% of their revenue online and they just came out of the problem state, right? So they've already recovered. Um, I got other clients that were doing 12% of revenue and, and, you know, they're doing staffing cuts and furloughs and, and payroll cuts and things like that. So there's really no one size kind of fits all. 
um, to be honest, I think what we're doing a lot with executives now is um, what's important this week, right? Because in retail, especially in fashion and footwear, where we're heavily concentrated, um, you know, everyone's trying to get to the other side of the river, right? The, the next big milestone is actually fall, right? September, October. So everyone's trying to make good decisions to survive on the retail side um, into fall. Once they get into fall, everybody feels like kind of the fog's going to open up and things are going to be okay. So what we're doing is we're having conversations every week and every two weeks about where are you struggling? What's important? How quickly can we pivot? We're also finding that there's a lot more good enough decisions being made, right? That um, perfection is the enemy of good. So we're seeing things where they're taking a step forward and they're trusting it because it, because it is their channel and they're seeing good results. You know, one of the things we try and tell folks on the retail side, traditional retail, is that you got one chance to get a feature out. You got one chance to make a move. Now it's every week you get that one chance and you got a hundred chances to look at that and revise it and make it better. So that's really what we're doing with our brands is I'm having weekly or every other week executive level conversations about are we okay? Are you okay? Do we need to adjust your billing terms? Do we need to adjust your project load? Do we need to slow down? Do we need to speed up? Is there a priority change with retail opening up right now? And, you know, if there is, what are sort of the criteria for opening? Because coming out of this, there's a thousand questions um, by a thousand people. Now, if you jump to the exact opposite side where we're looking at traditional um, food and beverage and distributorships and warehouses that quite honestly, Al, for years have been dragging their feet on digital, right? Nobody wanted to compete. They don't want to compete with the grocery stores. They don't want to compete with the restaurants, right? And they've primarily been B2B. They really haven't taken B2C as seriously um, as they are right now. And what we're finding is it's the exact opposite of retail, right? Because they're in, they have product. They have no way to get product out. They have no way to mobilize. They've got trucks and people and warehouses that are three, four, five, eight 800,000 square feet loaded up with dairy and eggs and cheese and um, you know, how do you get them out fast to market? You know, the reality is they have a really low SKU count. They have really low variance. So it's actually easy to get them up. It's really, it's a, it's a good thing if they're eager to um, sort of mobilize them. So it's kind of two different things. One is, you know, pent up inability to mobilize and move product. The other one is, you know, we, we just need to survive and get into the fall because you gotta remember in retail, um, all that product was paid for already, right? So all that product was made. I don't know how much of the audience is familiar with um, footwear and apparel and how that stuff works, but you know, we have to get to the next mile marker. In food and beverage and consumables and things like that, it's how quickly and how gritty can we get? And we see people literally lighting sites up in weeks um, when previously they've been told it takes months. And when you're sitting on 300,000 square feet of perishables, you know, the speed at which you make decisions that feel good enough is, is pretty impressive. So um, they have a whole different set of criteria, which is what happens when the markets do open up? Do you stay going direct? Can I still go to my distributorship down the road called Favorite Foods? Can I get 30 eggs? Can I get two gallons? I do it. I buy it. I buy everything in bulk right now. So there are two very different struggles. Um, I think beyond anything else, Al, what this has done is it's forced everybody to look at digital and say, this is a very, very important part of our future, regardless of whether it's a pre, a post, or a during COVID type of an event. We're proving that we're making years of advancements in weeks and that um, this is an important part of business. And I, I think it's quite frankly, at the end of the day, the person that benefits the most are, are consumers, right? It's you and it's me and it's my kids and, and it's my family. That's really ultimately because th there's just a change in thinking and there's too much, there's too much going on to have one answer for all. I know that was a long answer, no, no, no. but there's a lot, there's a lot to it. It's a very complicated topic. It's a very complicated topic. And, 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 you know, with this becoming forefront, uh, digital being getting the forefront for, for many of these brands that weren't digitally native before, you know, it forces us as technology providers or service providers to start innovating, right? Because maybe they're not ready today, but they will be ready in three, six months. And, and the consumers on the other end, there, there's a whole slew of new consumers that are discovering these services that weren't doing this before. 
before. And so right. their demands are different. They want a in-person experience, but now digitally done a little bit differently. And that will force right. us all to innovate differently. Now that might be innovation, might be on consumer experience. That innovation might be on distribution of products. So it might be yep. distribute from your store. And, and so as a technology you know, leader um, on your side, I mean, are you starting to think about some of these innovations or how you can bake it in and, and bring it together in a easier way to to people when they are ready eventually? Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting question, right? So how do I keep up with demand while innovating on what we see in front of everybody? I think that the reality is, is that the br there's no one size fits all. The brands are all over the board and some are really bullish and leaning into it and they want to be innovative. And somebody, some of them are quite frankly scared for their lives and, yeah. you know, what can we do to get through this week? So we are, and I think what's going to happen is that we're going to find that the digital team is going to be shoved in with traditional retail and traditional merchandising. And I think we're going to be able to have much more open dialogues about what does the store mean? What does retail mean? Um, what is the in-person experience? What is the shipping and unbox uh, unboxing experience? So we are, we're, we're having those dialogues, but you know, right now, quite frankly, Al, a lot of folks are just trying to, you know, get to the other side and get on dry land. Um, but we are, we're seeing a lot more really um, interesting conversations about how do I replicate retail online? And the reality is we can't replicate retail online. We, we, we have to stop thinking that we can, but how can we get kernels of the in-person experience to feel a little bit better online? Like if you go look at a hundred brands, um, they're probably only five looks between all of them, you know, realistically. Right. Yeah. Um, so how do we innovate? How do we, how do we look at what retail is? What is retail going to mean to us? And how do we get the personalized in-person experience? Because a lot of things value from this type of a dialogue. And that's another really interesting area. You know, I think we're going to see a lot more of this. I think we're yeah. going to see just like we saw zoom kind of fly off the handle with, with what's going on with their stock and meetings and product updates, I think we're going to start seeing a very different way of interacting with customers. And I think the thing that people have to keep in mind on the brand side, whether it's perishables and, and grocery and or fast fashion or, or sort of old school retail is that we're coming out of 12 to 16 weeks of embedded forced life changes. And I'm going to tell you right now, um, I'm going to go to the office guy. I'm in my house as my kids and artwork back here. Um, I can't imagine going to the office every day after this. Like the idea that I can go on my porch and have lunch with my kids, the idea that I can go split some wood for 15 minute break and come in here um, is, is life changing. And the fact that we've had UPS, FedEx and the mail person here all at least four or five times a week is really changed how we think as consumers about what it means to, to, to be active and get out and do things. I would much rather spend four hours at home in my yard with my children than take an hour drive for a two hour wait in the mall for an hour drive home, right? So I think retailers have to start thinking about that and realize that this actually isn't going to go away. How do we, how do we keep the momentum going? How do we keep digital as the focal point? And how do we shore up some of the broken experiences that are out there? Because I don't think we're too far away from, you know, we all go on those little sites where the little chat window comes up and you have no idea who you're talking to. You know, we're probably only six months from me being able to click to Al, right? And have this dialogue. Because you and I can have a much better dialogue like this. And I think this has proven, certainly those of us in the professional world that have to do Zooms, we're way more productive like this emails and, and chat windows and Slack. And, you know, this is it, this, this exists and it's, and it's good. And we need to embrace it and find the best way forward. And how do we get that into the buying experience is going to be a critical skill. Yeah. And I, I saw an example of that last, a few days ago, uh, specifically was, I think it was Gucci uh, with, you know, it's an upscale, a scale brand, but it's, it's disrupted the model now. And so what they're doing is they're introducing this personalized shoppers that are essentially 
doing what you're talking about, just just showcasing the brand, actually going to each of the products, showcasing the product in a more personalized way, having a conversation with the with the receiver as opposed to just displaying something in there. And and so that's that's Absolutely. an example of what you're talking about. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And I and I think we're going to see a fundamental change. I don't know that we'll ever get back to normal. I think this kind of is the new normal, but we have to embrace um, how you and I buy now, right? And how our friends buy and how we all shop and, and how fulfillment happens. The unboxing experience is never been more important than it is right now. And even these micro dialogues that we have, buying the right product in the right size and getting an authentic person to give you an authentic opinion that knows the brand and knows the products and can say, eh, I know that sounds like a great idea, but actually, why don't you show me your closet? Like, can we go up and can you, can I, can you show me what's in your closet and how you write? I mean, we're there now. And yeah. when you think about that, that that's everything from yard work to, to, to cooking, to cleaning. It's, it's literally everything. It's pervasive. And we've yeah. allowed everybody the last 12 weeks into our homes. You guys are in my house right now, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, that's not going to go away. And I think that brands are eager to find out what the best way to harness that is. Makes sense. You know, I think uh, one of the other topics that that is near and dear to our heart is is the topic of how we keep customers around. I mean, there's been this time where we've had a little bit of a disconnect with our customers. Our customers are finding new ways to discover us. Our customers are finding new ways to to even consider whether we go there or not. And you know, I'm a big movie buff, so we did a discussion around movie theaters, and you can't go there anymore. And and for me, not having that experience and restarting that experience means someone needs to bring me back into that experience and make me feel good about what I felt good about before. And so yeah, it's yeah, re-earning that customer trust, right? Re-earning that customer yeah. trust and, and then retaining that customer is even more important than before. You know, what are your thoughts on retention and loyalty and, and how important that might be in the years to come? Well, I'll tell you what, um, I don't have any conversation in the last year in the volume that I have loyalty conversations. Um, loyalty is number one and it's coming up more and more. And I think, you know, I think that we've become almost lazy to what it means to keep customers loyal. Um, I think that there's been this expectation that if we have a good product and a good service, they'll keep coming back and we treat it almost as this institutional relationship, but you know, loyalty comes up on every project that I work on. Um, I'm literally doing a project right now in a completely unrelated vertical that we normally work with and loyalty is, is their number one thing. So I think we have to re envision what it means to stay in touch with the customer. I still think e even as mature as digital feels and, you know, we see, you know, it's easy to point to the apples and the Nikes and the Pumas and the Adidas of the world. Um, but the reality is, is they're one tenth of 1% of, of really, you know, what's possible, right? Um, most brands aren't doing basic welcome campaigns. Most brands aren't doing educational series on a highly evolved, highly intellectually um, deep um, product set or something like that. So I, I think loyalty is critical. And I think between um, loyalty programs in general, recognition, point systems, single sign-on authentication, closing the loop on communications, um, you know, email. I, I think we can do a better job with that. And I think people are just starting to wake up. I've had more conversations in literally the last six months on loyalty than I've had in the last five years, um, which is roughly about how long I've, I've known you, as a matter of fact. But um, we're seeing an explosion in it because we're starting to see traditional retailers where loyalty was what they did start to move into digital. And we've never really had a lot of loyalty thought leadership in digital, in my opinion, right? That's always been a retail thing for me, um, or at least my experience has been. So I, I think it's big. I think it's probably one of the largest um, segments of opportunity right now. I don't, I don't think brands, I think they sometimes look at it and they think, am I being too annoying? Am I sending too many emails? Am I trying too hard? Are my, you know, are my points worth enough? Are my affiliates worth enough? And I think we have to stop doing that. I think we have to just be real smart. It's not a rip and repeat. You need to think about it. It is a integrated, multi-channel, multi-day, multi-touch campaign. But once you get them, you get them. And it isn't all about selling products. Sometimes it's just about teaching them something they didn't know. And I don't know about you, Al, but 
as a kid going through school, the teachers that stick out in my mind and the people in my life that I never forget are the ones that taught me something. So I think as brands, if we, if we start thinking about how do we become educators and friends and humanize the brand customer connection, I think we'll see a lot of, a lot of doors open on the loyalty space personally. Absolutely. And, and this is a great point you bring up. I mean, it's, it's about the entire customer experience. It's not about sales yeah. only. Um, and education is a huge, huge part of that customer experience, especially now. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, be, so it's they, a long play. You got to have a long play. Long play. Absolutely. And across channels. Uh, you know, I want to go back to a point that you mentioned before and I switch a little bit from business to, to personal because you said, that, you know, we're in this for a while. Life has changed, you know, significantly for all of us, um, you know, in here. You write a lot about that on LinkedIn. And by the way, for everyone else, if they don't follow TJ on LinkedIn, please do that tomorrow because I really like and follow what a lot of stuff you're writing. But this one's more on the personal personal side that you you write a lot about the change in life and, and how we are all being able to kind of adapt in our own personal lives. Uh, and, and we all have to succeed personally before we can succeed in business. We have, sure. to, we have to adapt ourselves personally to this new normal before we can start helping everyone else around us. You know, what's your advice around how you're trying to think about this? And, and I know you've shared some of that on, on LinkedIn, but if you can yeah. help there, that'd be great. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting. I think that, um, so for me, when we started work from home, um, it was a challenge for me. Um, I don't work from home and I'm not used to being around my kids 24 um, seven. And I think that I quickly came to this realization that, you know, work wasn't work for me. It was um, just life. And my family wasn't, just family to me it was what I it's everything I do my kids are everything to me I have three teenage boys and you know I started to have a lot of thoughts and which is why I actually started writing on LinkedIn is about um, I think we have to we have to stop drawing a hard line between um, Thomas Obrey or TJ as the professional and TJ is the father that cooks and roasts beans and bakes bread from scratch. And then the TJ that you see at trade shows, which, you know, I own like the midnight to 5 a.m. sort of schedule with everybody, right? I, th I think we have to start humanizing the reality that in order for this to work, what you and I are doing, we have to acknowledge that I'm a dad and you're a dad and my dog is right next to me. I don't know if you guys saw his head come in. He kept smacking me in the shoulder. He wanted me to pet his neck. Um, I'm going to have kids screaming in the background. So I think this humanized us in a certain way. And I think it forced us to be more tolerant and patient of um, the reality of what we always dealt with and held in, uh, behind the scenes as professionals, right? We all go to work and we get mad at each other and there's all this angst and it's like, oh my God, I can't wait to get in the car and go home. And you know, the reality is we all get up, we all got in the car, we all went to work, we all had the same arguments, we all got in the car, we all went home, we took care of our families. And I don't think that that's two separate things anymore. I think it's one thing. And I think we're working more than ever. Um, I'm working 12 hour days, I'm busier than I've ever been, and I don't have a commute. Um, but I think the other part is that we all are still struggling for balance. And I think if I had one word of wisdom for anybody is that don't, I don't look at this anymore as being trapped. I look at this as a really interesting opportunity. I get to walk outside, you know, whenever I want for 10 minutes and clear my head. It, 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 uh, it's okay that I'm working 12, 14 hour days because guys, the reality is I'm not working 12 or 14 hour days. I am available for 12 or 14 hours, but I take time off in the morning. I take time off in the early afternoon. I cook for my kids. I go get the mail. You know, how many of us had a chance to go get the mail and clear our head after a tough call? We didn't. And I think that we have to find ways to balance it. You know, anybody that even watches this video, like um, when you're done, uh, shut this and go outside and walk around your yard. And if you don't have a yard, just walk around your block and leave your phone home and and just embrace the the freedom that you've been able to do that. Obviously, there's a lot of things you need to consider on where you live. But for me, I found a new level of balance that I didn't know existed. And um, I'm closer with our employees and I'm closer with my friends. And if you read some of my LinkedIn stuff, like 
I realized that I don't miss all of the work events. I miss all the people. Like I miss hanging out with you, Al. Like yeah. I only saw you four times a year. We talked for a half hour, but God, I miss that. Right. Same with Steve. And you know, I miss the people. And I think that's the thing that I now appreciate more than anything. Yeah, and I think I think that's the same with us. And I, I used to be a big believer in in everyone in the office, and I'm sort of opposite now. And and so so I'm already adapting, right? I mean, I'm like I can't go back. I I want to stay with my kids all the time. You know, my daughter will come in, <laughs> she'll hug me, and she'll go back. And I didn't I did not have that before. I just I was in the office, you know, 8 a.m. to like 7, 6 p.m., 7 p.m. And and I miss those hugs, that random hugs. They just come and give me that. And and I think that brings pleasure in life. And some of these things are 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 great. And so just learning to adapt what we have and just like, you know, the days are extending, but we feel like they're extending. But as long as you, we, we can find some internal happiness, I think, like you said, and and, exactly. uh, and and get what we can get, like, you know, one of you talk about walking out in there and we, I live in LA and, you know, beautiful city, but I, I didn't walk out and see the sun as much when I was in the office that I do now. Like I, I'm able to actually experience, it, you know, the, the weather, which is, which is yeah. beautiful. So uh, yeah. that's great words of advice, uh, TJ. Uh, at that point, we'll, we'll end this one. I really appreciate you taking the time and spending some time today. Um, you know, we will uh, share this with everyone else and, and uh, for everyone else, if you want to see, other ones uh, like the one we did with TJ, please go to annexcloud.com slash market movers. TJ, thank you again. Thanks, Al.